Good Sunday morning, Northeast Ohio. Welcome to April, or what T.S. Eliot called the cruelest month. President Trump is hoping it's better than March was, but despite some setbacks, there is something for the president to hang his hat on, and that is the new Baldwin Wallace survey out this week that showed, despite what some are calling a rough start, his supporters still support him. The first two months of the Trump presidency have been nothing if not eventful, filled with promises kept related to the Supreme Court pick of Neil Gorsuch and attempts at health care and travel bans that didn't end the way the administration planned. But ask yourself this question. If you had the chance to do it all over again, take a mulligan on your vote, would you? The folks at Baldwin Wallace's Community Research Institute asked Ohio voters that very question. And as you can see, not even close. 94% of them wouldn't change their vote. Only 2.4% would. People are looking for that outsider to come in, shake the place up, try to make a difference in terms of the political system. Trump is doing that. Now, we may see that as a lot of mistakes and stumblings and failures, but so long as he continues to be the outsider, he continues to get hardcore support from his hardcore supporters. Part of that may have to do with the fact that the president's repeated tweets decrying the dishonest media and their fake news seem to be resonating. They asked voters, who do you trust more to tell the truth? 33% said the media, an equal number said President Trump. Among Republicans, though, 61% trust Trump, while only 8.5% the media. The Trump administration's strategy has been to delegitimize the, the mainstream media, and it appears that his supporters are loving it. And for the record, local media continues to be among the most trusted as we strive to bring you on a daily basis where Carl Bernstein defined journalism as the best obtainable version of the truth. Well, during the campaign, President Trump and Hillary Clinton spent a lot of time here in Northeast Ohio because Cuyahoga County continues to wield its fair share of political weight, but that grip is slipping. We're no longer the largest county in the state, according to new census numbers. Franklin County is. You may not have seen the moving truck, but 15 people left Cuyahoga County yesterday, preceded by 15 people the day before that, and 15 people the day before that. In fact, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the slow drip has been to the tune of more than 30,000 over the last six years, but more than 5,600 in the last year alone. To put that number in perspective, there are more than 3,100 counties in the United States. Only three of them had greater population losses than Cuyahoga County, Cook County, Illinois, Chicago, Wayne County, Michigan, Detroit, and Baltimore. But ask yourself a question. What do they all have in common? They're all older counties on bodies of water built out with not a lot of room to grow. And the size of the families occupying the homes that exist are now smaller. A lot of single person households in Cairo County, the millennials living near downtown and some of the other developing neighborhoods of the city of Cleveland, for example, are often one or two person households. To be clear, urban sprawl to surrounding counties, the foreclosure crisis and the loss of jobs have taken its toll with the county suburbs suffering losses as well. We used to think of just Cleveland as being the problem area of the county many years ago. Now, now it's become some of those entering suburbs and it's spreading into some of the other suburbs as well. And that has put a drain on Cuyahoga County resources because fewer people means fewer dollars coming in. That's what made the whole Cleveland Cavaliers request for financial aid in transforming the queue a bit of a lightning rod this year. That being said, County Council this week approved the spending plan. Now Cleveland City Council is on the clock. Team reps meeting with that body this week to go over their part of the public funding that will be needed to pay for the project. Cavs owner Dan Gilbert is putting up half the money. The county, city, and destination Cleveland putting up the rest, mainly through funds generated at the queue itself and through a lease extension by the Cavs. Attorney Fred Nance, who is working with the county on the plan, who played a key role in the Browns coming back to Cleveland, told City Council that lease extension beyond 2027 to 2034 is key. If the renovations aren't made and the lease not extended, he warned, he wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years when the lease expires, Dan Gilbert decides to sell the team. And then... When an owner buys a franchise, that owner's going to say, I want a new facility or I'm out of here. We've seen that play out over and over and over again. Come 2027, the cost of a new arena in downtown Cleveland is projected to be anywhere from 500 to 700 million dollars. So it's pay me now, pay me more later or risk losing the team. Cleveland City Council remains the last hurdle, but they are expected to approve the spending plan sometime later this month. The Cavaliers would like to begin the construction after the NBA Finals in June, hopefully, because they'd like to see the work completed in 2019 because at this point they have their eye on hosting the 2020 NBA All-Star Game.
Well, it's not the All-Star Game, but the city of Sandusky is hosting a big event this week. Governor John Kasich continuing his tradition of taking the legislature on the road for his state of the state this year, heading to the North Coast. It all takes place Tuesday night at 7 when the address will be held inside the historic Sandusky State Theater. It's, I think, a, just an incredible facility. I love going up to Sandusky. It's just a stone's throw away from Vermilion, where as a kid I used to go up and with my mother and father and and uh, our family and, and my aunt and my uncle, a lot of good memories when I first really learned how much I loved Ohio. And so I'm sort of in that vicinity. It'll be fun. Our cabinet will come up. It'll meet with all the groups. It's what we always do. And uh, I wanted to do it on the lake. We're doing it a little bit later in April because I, I really didn't want to have the snow effect. But who knows? Maybe, <laughs> maybe it will snow on our, on our event. Man, I hope not. No snow this Tuesday, no snow next Tuesday either. That's opening day. And you remember last year we got iced out. The Indians opening tomorrow on the road in Texas. And since we began with T.S. Eliot, we're going to end with Alexander Pope, who penned the motto of opening day, hope springs eternal. Of course, he also wrote the words fools rush in, proving that he was indeed a baseball fan. With Democracy 2017, I'm John Kosick. Enjoy your Sunday.